Good morning. It's now 9 a.m. Pacific time and noon in Washington, D.C., which means that we'll be starting class right now. <laughs> so over the next couple days, I want to talk about molecular structure and intramolecular forces and what binds molecules together, not in the sense of chemistry, which is rearrangement of electrons and bonding and ionic bonding and covalent bonding and things like that, but rather how, uh, but rather how <coughs> atoms and molecules interact with each other in a non-covalent way. So we're going to dive into the uh, into intermolecular forces and how those intermolecular forces, when integrated over uh, over the uh, over many, many atoms and molecules in, say, a nanoparticle, and i got to fix this audio somehow, um, have a uh, manifest in interparticle forces. So how do, uh, how do, is that better? Can you hear still? Can you hear still? Okay. Um, how those, par how those intermolecular forces manifest in nanoparticles and how we can use uh, insights into van concepts like dipole-dipole forces, um, uh, dispersion forces, and so on, to quantify the ways that matter is held together in the non-chemical sense. So how does a van der Waals bond work? How does it explain everyday uh, phenomena? But in order to do that, we need to spend another five to 10 minutes um, developing our just really basic literacy in organic structures. And we talked a little bit about this a few classes ago, but I just wanna, wanna give you the, uh, a little bit more of the, of the basics of organic uh, nomenclature. And in particular, it, it, counting 10 in organic chemistry. So the number of carbon atoms as we go from one to uh, one to ten. For one, how do you say one in organic? Meth, two, at three, pro, four, butyl. Five pent, six hex, seven hept, eight oct, nine known, ten dec. And how do we use these uh, these these organic words We have something, so I said before that a carbon atom had to be bonded to five, or to four things, not five things. Five in Texas, but in California, it binds to four things. And then at the end, I was married in Texas, it's okay if I say that. So at the end of this, of this bond, it doesn't matter what this is over here, we call this group a methyl group, and the YL mean the methyl, the YL part, means that it's bonded to something that we don't, we don't care what it is. So this is uh, methyl. And in the case where this thing is bonded to an H, so H, 3, C, H, we have methane. Incidentally, in the case where we don't care what this is, but we know that it's a, uh, we know that it's a hydrocarbon, it's one of these things, they go beyond 10, but this is the only, this is as far as we really care about. If we don't care what this is, we call this, uh, we call this um, an al uh, alkane. And if we don't know what either one of them are, 
We call this group over here an R, and it's bonded to something. We call this alkyl. So these are so methyl, ethyl, propyl, butyl would all be examples of alkyl groups. If they were all, uh, if they all had an H at the end, they'd be methane, ethane, propane, butane, and so on. Okay, a little bit about uh, functional groups. Usually, these things are pretty unreactive. You can burn them; they combine readily with oxygen and give off water vapor and carbon dioxide basis of how your car runs, unless you have an electric car. Uh, and so these things are pretty unreactive, unless you do something really special to, uh, to activate them. Um, so we have uh, just a couple of groups that are, uh, that are by far the most common. They say that the best way to learn a new language is to memorize the most common 1,000 words. Uh, well, these are the three most common, let's say, yeah, three most common functional groups. Alcohol, ethanol makes you happy, methanol makes you blind. <laughs> This is a carboxylic acid. <coughs> or just an acid, an organic acid. And NH2 is called an amine. You combine an acid and an and amine, you get an amino acid. This particular amino acid is important in biochemistry. It's the simplest amino acid. It's called glycine. one of the uh, 20 or so amino acids of which uh, most proteins are made. So how would you go about combining the counting to 10 with the functional groups? The way that I like to count <coughs> carbon atoms is count to one as soon as your pencil or chalk hits the paper or board, respectively. And then you draw a zigzag, and at every ver vertex in the zigzag, you count to the next number. So if I want to draw n equals 8 octane, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 octane. If I want to draw octanol, which is octane with an alcohol at the end, then one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, so the eighth carbon, but then I need a bond to the OH, and this is octanol. What if I want to draw an uh, an alcohol, or I'm sorry, a, a carboxylic acid, we say one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. But since the eighth carbon atom is already part of the carboxylic acid, this is where I stop and I draw the acid, and this is octanoic. Octanoic acid or octane carboxylic acid. How about if we want an amine, 
same thing as the as octanol. Go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And then this is the eighth carbon atom, and the next atom is the nitrogen. So this is amino octane. So because there's a carbon atom, the question was, in the case of naming acids, the carboxylic acid already has one of the carbon atoms in it. So this is our eighth carbon atom, part of the acid. OK. This is, this is not an organic chemistry class. I'm just teaching you what you need to know to, in order to do nanoengineering with organic chemistry, which includes all of polymer science, all of microfabrication engineering, all of, um, uh, all of <coughs> formulations, all of biochemistry. It's really important that we know just a little bit, uh, um, even though this is not a prerequisite. So we drew benzene before. Benzene is this cyclic structure. You'll notice irritatingly, or maybe not irritatingly, that once you get above, once you get some organic structures that have slightly more complexity than just some number of carbon atoms, they tend to go by common names. And that's because the, the systematic names get out of control really quickly. So this would be 135-cyclohexatriene, but we're not going to call it that ever. We're going to call it benzene, as in do not clean your Nintendo games with benzene or paint thinner or other organic solvents, if people still have Nintendo games. Okay, this again, by way of review, is this six carbon uh, structure. And we have bonds here, here, and double bonds here, here, and here. And because each carbon atom needs to be bonded to four things, you get two things per double bond, we have to uh, add the hydrogen atoms. Sometimes this is drawn in even more <coughs> shorthand, like this. Why would it be drawn like this? In the special case of certain cyclic structures that have alternating double and single bonds, they're called aromatic, and that's really a historical accident because things that look like this tend to smell. A lot of other things smell too, but this got the word aromatic. Sorry, future scene, you're not aromatic. So these electrons, because it doesn't really matter if we draw the bond here or here, or the, the double bond here or here or here, they can actually, the electrons actually are completely delocalized in the ring. So this is also okay to draw like this. <laughs> What about bond strengths? And how much energy is in a molecular interaction? And how do those compare to the bond strengths of, uh, of between nanoparticles? So bond strengths. And this will be in, uh, in units of energy. So bond strength in kilojoules per mole. So 
how about covalent bonds? Carbon carbon, sort of the lifeblood of organic chemistry and biochemistry. It's the framework. It's the it's the uh, the drywall and multi-purpose spackle of organic chemistry. 346 kilojoules per mole. CH, 411. C double bond C, 602. Now the way I always think about this, I, I would never Notice I had to look up my look at my notes. I would never know this to three digits. I would just say single bonds around 400 kilojoules per mole. Double bonds, carbon-carbon double bonds, about 50% more than that. How about uh, how about ionic bonds? How about NaCl? A little bit more than a covalent bond, but on the same order of magnitude. What if it's um, lithium fluoride? More energy or less energy? More. Why more? They both have the same charge, <laughs> but they're both smaller. So by Coulomb's law, the centers of of, of the charge density are closer together, and therefore the energy is greater. So this is an ionic bond. How about a hydrogen bond? Let's say, let's say H2O hydrogen bonded to H2O. So, <coughs> When you have a very electronegative atom bonded to hydrogen, you get something called a hydrogen bond, which is that the electronegative atom sucks all the electron density away from the hydrogen atom, but the hydrogen atom doesn't have much electron density to give away, to share. So if you suck away a little bit of its electron density and it only has one electron, it's basically a, uh, like a naked positive charge. So this is a particularly strong kind of dipole-dipole interaction. And we get about 25 kilojoules per mole. I, I don't like when people do that. Five goes here, two goes here, just, just to keep it in line. OK. How about, uh, how about other types of van der Waals interactions? And we'll, uh, I think I can fit it here. How about uh, how about methane methane CH four CH four? Now this is not a hydrogen bond because carbon is not electronegative enough to suck enough electron density away from hydrogen. In fact, hydrogen is slightly more electronegative than carbon is, so it would actually go in the other direction. But if this, if this Van der Waals uh, bond, is it uh, it's stronger or weaker than this? Weaker by about a factor of 10. So it's about two to three kilojoules per mole. And in fact, if you have a, a long hydrocarbon chain, like decane, like octane, decane, if it's C20, it's isocane. Then you can add up contributions from each one of the CH2 groups along the chain with its near, nearest neighbor, and you end up getting about two to three kilojoules per mole per CH2 uh, group. Yes, yeah, so uh, octane is a liquid. At some point along the chain, at room temperature, um, I don't know where this occurs, but maybe I'll make a note in the, in the YouTube video after I look it up on the internet machine, you'll a trollmatron. 
uh, it becomes the melting temperature goes uh, goes uh, above room temperature. So um, you add up all these Van der Waals forces, and then ultimately the hydrocarbon becomes solid, like a like a wax, like paraffin wax, which is you know C20 and and so on. If you get so long, you start to have entanglements too, which also change the mechanical properties. So like spaghetti, where the uh, where the the individual strands of spaghetti tie in knots because they can slide past each other but not through each other. You change the mechanical properties in that way too. And that's like a milk jug. Milk jug is a polyethylene and it's uh, a high density polyethylene. Um, and so it's, it's an alkane, but it maybe has a molecular weight of 100,000 or a million. No. Are those under like let's let's call these uh, Van der Waals. So then, how about alkane? Alkane. So I'm going to draw a bond here, but it's not a bond in the same sense that this is a bond. This is like a physical electrostatic bond, Van der Waals bond. <laughs> but it's, but a, there's kind of like, there's a physicist's bond and there's a chemist's bond. But as an engineer, we don't care whether it's physics or, or, or chemistry. So they're all, they're all bonds. And this is about uh, two to three kilojoules per mole, give or take, give or take even 100%. But who cares? It's less than 10 kilojoules per mole. It's more than one kilojoule per mole. Per CH2 unit. Now, it's worth considering how much energy this, this actually is. The, we have this, this concept of, of, uh, of a thermal energy, energy that's always available to break up bonds, like to break up the Van der Waals bonds between octane, whose, uh, let's not use octane, let's use methane, because it's propane, because it's a, it's a or butane, because it's a liquid and a lighter, but then if you were to break apart the lighter, it would evaporate very quickly because it's under pressure being confined in the plastic. There's a lot of energy around that serves to break up those, those Van der Waals bonds. And that energy is the thermal energy, which we've seen before is just the universal gas constant times the ambient temperature. So RT in units of, of joules uh, per mole. Thermal energy RT is 2.5 kilojoules per mole. The rule of thumb is that if an interaction is approximately in order of magnitude greater than the thermal energy, then it will tend to be in a condensed phase at room temperature. You need a bond strength of about 10 k 10 times the thermal energy in order to remain a solid or liquid at room temperature. Rough rule of thumb. And that's at room temp. Of 298 Kelvin. Some of you may also have seen the Boltzmann constant. KB. KB is the Boltzmann constant, and it's like the universal gas constant, but it's on a per molecule basis instead of a, on a per mole basis. And 
what it equals is the universal gas constant divided by Avogadro's number, 6 times 10 to the 23rd per mole. So when we're talking about individual nanoparticle molecules and na nanoparticles, bonds, molecules, and nanoparticles, We're not, we don't usually talk about it in the chemist's language of RT. We usually talk about it in the physicist's language of KT, KBT. Usually I'll slip up and say KT. I'm always talking about KBT, ultimate constant times, uh, room temperature, which unless specified otherwise, T is always gonna be 298 Kelvin. At physiological temperature, 36 or 37, thank you, 37 degrees, then it will be a little bit higher. So 4 times 10 to the minus 21 joules is KB. KBT. So let's uh, talk about how these structures assemble in water. So we can have a lot of different uh, interactions and different solvents. Uh, water is the most peculiar solvent, also probably the most useful solvent. So structures like carboxylic acids are readily ionized in water. The, the, uh, the acid has an H atom that tends to want to dissociate, so you have a, a, uh, an, a uh, an oxygen that's, that has a minus sign on it as the proton flips away. But then you have this hydrocarbon chain that uh, does not like water, or rather, water does not like it. Water may like it, but water likes itself more. So as a result, you have structures that assemble on the nanoscale, and this is the basis of, uh, of lipid, uh, of liposome drug formulations. So amphiphilic structures, they self-assemble in, uh, in water. And if you take the compound um, sodium dodecyl sulfate, one, so dodecyl is, is I, I didn't count to 12, but do, dodecyl is the 12 carbon uh, uh, unit in organic chemistry. You have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, and then you have a sulfate group. Don't memorize the structure of this or anything. I want to show you the, uh, the, the, uh, the principles. This is called sodium dodecyl sulfate. SDS, or if you looked at your shampoo bottle this morning, you will have seen it as sodium lauryl sulfate. And what happens when you put this in, uh, in water is that you have the Hydrophobic the hydrophobic chain, uh, tail and the hydrophilic head group pointing in opposite directions. So 
So you have SO4 minus SO4 minus SO4 minus SO4 minus SO4 minus SO4 minus. This is called a micelle. as opposed to your cell. <laughs> and it's a few nanometers in, uh, in diameter. This is a really simple kind of nanoparticle that we deal with basically every day, if we wash our hands. So a somewhat more sophisticated type of amphiphilic molecule is something like a phospholipid, which is what the cell membrane is made of, and it makes something else. It makes a, uh, a bilayer vesicle. So if we have something that looks like this. Who cares how many carbon atoms it has, honestly? And we sometimes represent it like this. We get another kind of self-assembled structure, and I'm going to butcher the drawing, so sorry. This is a bilayer vesicle. <coughs> like the cell. This is a really tiny bilayer vesicle. Um, they're usually, like on this scale, it would be the size of this room. Um, and a bilayer vesicle has some, uh, the, the, it forms a bilayer vesicle instead of a micelle because these structures form more of a cylindrical structure in solution, whereas this is more of like a, like a cone. Cones tend to pack together like a sphere, whereas cylinders tend to pack together like a, like a bilayer. Yeah, because of the extra tail, it's, uh, it's kind of fatter at the end, and geometrically it would prefer to be in a structure like this. Now the reason it curves around itself, did I anticipate a question? So the reason it curves around itself, because if it were a sheet of infinite extent, the ends would be very unhappy. The reason the ends would be unhappy is because they'd, the hydrophobic groups at the ends would still be interacting with water, and water doesn't want to interact with the ends of the hydrophobic groups. So ultimately, because these structures have lots of thermal energy, or they have the thermal energy of the biological milieu or the sink when we're washing our hands, although we wouldn't be washing our hands if possible if it's never mind, but um, it would come together as a, uh, as, a, as a spherical round structure. Yeah? So the uh, sort of cone shapes, uh, SDS, automatically has more of a curvature to itself, so but it quickly forms a single layer, whereas this, it wants to form a sheet, Mm -hmm. Yeah, it would almost, it, this, this process would definitely be slower, almost certainly be slower. Okay, let's, let's go into detail on intermolecular forces and what do we really mean by Van der Waals forces, why are things high in energy at the ends of, of structures? Why, um, or at the ends of, of, of sheets, what do we even mean for something to be high in energy? What is energy? Molecules and nanoparticles, and all matter in fact, all matter in fact, this, this is actually the basis for why anything happens ever. 
uh, things want to lower their energy. And energy is this concept that uh, needs to be lowered. So, um, what is, what, how, does, how does that influence how matter assembles and how it interacts with itself? So, electrostatic electrostatic self, uh, self energy. Does a charge in a vacuum, say there's nothing in the universe except for a lone charge, like a sodium ion, Na plus. It's the only thing anywhere in sight. Does it, uh, does it, is it, is it relative to the vacuum? Is it happy to be itself, but happy to be in existence? No, getting, getting head shakes, no. Would it prefer to bond with a chloride, chloride ion if it were close by? Yes. Yeah, it definitely would. But why, but we don't usually, can, how, about, how about this? A lithium ion, Li plus, existing with nothing else around, or a sodium atom, Na plus, existing with nothing else around. Which is happier? Sodium, sodium is happier. Why is sodium happier? It's bigger, so it's slightly less likely. It's resting energy state. The first ion form is lower than that. The lithium is very, very small. Yeah, so size, size is everything. Charges, so energy, anything charged has a high potential energy. We'll talk about that in, in a second. And energy can reduce itself by delocalizing or by drawing other charged groups to it or away from it if it's charged the same way. So this seems like obviousness, but I hope to explain it in a way that maybe you haven't seen before. Imagine you have a <coughs> sphere with radius A. So we're going to calculate the uh, calculate the unhappiness or electrostatic potential or, or uh, electrostatic potential energy of this sphere. Essentially, all matter has electrostatic potential energy with it that must be lowered, and that's why anything associates with anything else. So imagine we have this, this sphere, and what we want to do is calculate the work done to charge it in units. Say we want to get this up to uh, a single electronic charge of, of the fundamental charge E. But we start in units of infinitesimal charge. So if we start with a unit of infinitesimally small charge and we add another infinitesimally charge, small charge to it, does the potential energy go up or go down? It goes up. Because we're taking, we're creating this, this bigger charge from lots of little infinitesimal charges. So we want to calculate the work done to charge the sphere up to some charge, big Q, capital Q, in units of little uh, dqs. That L looks like the new Chargers logo. Calculate. Calculate the work to charge. Charge. Sphere in increments of dq.
So we need to find an expression for dw, which is the q that we start out with times dq. This is just the Coulomb energy over 4 pi epsilon naught epsilon times A, which is just the Coulomb energy of some charge Q plus some infinitesimally charged Q at a radius of A, and A is the radius of the sphere. Yeah? So you would be perfect, so each step of the interval, that will be the Yeah. So what we have is the integral of dw equals the integral from 0 to big Q, which is the final Q that we're going to end up with, of little q dq over 4 pi epsilon naught epsilon times A equals Q squared over 8 pi epsilon naught epsilon A equals the work done to charge the sphere. So the work done to charge the sphere is the, uh, is the electrostatic potential energy. This term, is it, is it better relative to zero to have a potential energy that's positive or negative? And by better, I mean more stable, less reactive, less likely to associate with other ions in order to increase its self-confidence by lowering its self-energy and be happier. Bad analogy. This is always going to be positive because of the square term. So this is always positive because it is destabilizing. to confine <coughs> charges and the smaller a region that we're confining the charges the more destabilized smaller the a the bigger the uh, the bigger the the self energy so lowering this quantity is the basis of all intermolecular forces. Lowering the electrostatic self-energy of a molecule or ion or nanoparticle <laughs> or polymer or phospholipid, a component of a phospholipid bilayer is the basis of why you get any nanoscopic self-assembly whatsoever. OK, we got to the end of the course, and it's only the end of week two. So this is lowering this quantity. So lowering the Coulomb electrostatic, whatever, self-energy by increasing the size or associating with other, let's call them species. We all like pets. Lowering the Coulomb or electrostatic energy or electrostatic self energy by increasing its size or associating with other species, like a sodium and a, chlor a chloride ion or like two molecules of water, or two molecules in the phospholipid. I, I erased it. I was going to say deleted, but you don't delete things on a chalkboard. <laughs> uh, that's how you lower the, uh, the electrostatic self-energy. Uh, so this is, so lowering is the basis of all, oh, let's say almost, nah, mm, all. We'll be, we'll be bold, we'll be bold today, of all intermolecular
intermolecular, nanoparticle, internanoparticle, intersurface, <laughs> forces. We can use this concept of electrostatic self-energy to also calculate the self-energy of a dipole. This is the, the dipole. Self-energy. And we're going to can consider a really simple kind of dipole, which is just two ions that are directly bonded in contact. So two ions in contact of charges, partial charges plus small q and minus little q with radius that each have the same radius of A, and the length of the dipole is L. We're going to define a quantity called the dipole moment. U, the dipole moment U, which equals one of the partial charges, magnitude of the partial charge, times the length of the dipole, and this is the center to center distance. And what we end up with is a, a, an expression that's very similar to the electrostatic self energy of a single charge or single ion, is if we take the constants out front, 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught epsilon times the quantity q squared over 2a plus q squared over 2a, which is the unfavorable uh, self-energies of the two constituent ions that make up the dipole. But then because we brought these two together, and they want to be together because they're oppositely charged, we end up lowering the self-energy of the system because we've satisfied some of this, this, uh, this, um, this uh, self-loathing of one atom by bringing, or one ion by bringing one of the opposite charge close to it, and it relaxes. So electrostatic potential energy goes down. So we have a minus term of minus q squared over 2a. And if you do a little bit of, uh, of substitution here for the definition of dipole moment, you get u squared over 4 pi epsilon naught epsilon times L cubed. And this is the ultimately unfavorable self-energy of a dipole. This is why dipoles want to align in certain ways. And I'll start here again on, uh, on Monday. Um, so these are the unfavorable terms due to the ions. This is the favorable term of bringing them together. I'll, uh, have a good weekend. I'll see you on Monday.